Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I want to welcome you back to the program again today and uh, thank you for joining us every week and for sharing with your friends and telling them about us. We thank you also when you see this program uh, on Facebook that you share it with your friends and it helps us to get the gospel around the world. We, we are deeply grateful for that. Uh, uh, we just, uh, you know, we have just finished a series uh, with Dr. Jonathan Weldon, so for the next couple of weeks I'll be on by myself sharing the Word of God. And uh, the last uh, time I was on by myself, we have been dealing with the book of Matthew. Uh, we're going to come back and uh, we're going to uh, touch the book of Matthew chapter 8 today. If you want to get your Bible or your device or your computer, follow along with us. Uh, I believe you'll be blessed to join us. Uh, if you've missed any of our programs, like I said, I was doing some things in the consecutive order in the book of Matthew, and then for the last couple of weeks, of course, we had, uh, Dr., like I said, Dr. Jonathan Weldon was on with me, and then uh, Pastor David Hughes was on as well. So we're going to kind of pick back up in the book of Matthew, but if you've missed any of these, uh, you can go back to our YouTube page and watch them on demand. Everything that we have... Uh, aired to date uh, is archived there. Uh, if you don't get this channel, uh, maybe you're in a hotel room or you're watching this with a friend, but if you don't get this uh, channel on your particular uh, home uh, entertainment center, you can always get us through YouTube. And so uh, uh, you can then, you can also download the RSS feed. You can go to our iTunes podcast, sign up for our podcast and get the audio portions of this, uh, of our broadcast. Uh, I want to say again how deeply grateful we are to you, our partners, who help us uh, financially to take the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of His grace around the world. We're truly catching on on a global level. And uh, right as I film this, I am preparing, probably by the time this airs, I will have already returned from the Netherlands. And so this will be my first time in the Netherlands. And uh, an effectual door has been opened there. And uh, of course, last year we went to Lima, Peru, and we were in uh, Brazil and um, Canada and, and just all over uh, in many places sharing the gospel. It is your partnership that helps us be able to do that. And, uh, you know, if you're able to help us, we, we're deeply grateful for it. We believe God's able to lay it on the hearts of the people who are enjoying what we're saying uh, and that want to get behind what we're doing in order to help be a part of something big that's taking the gospel around the world. And uh, I'm certain we're not the only ones that are taking the gospel around the world, but I, I feel like we have a niche that the Lord has given us that's our assignment. And uh, uh, your help to do that is really, like I said, deeply and greatly appreciated. Uh, uh, become a partner today. Consider becoming a partner with us in our ministry because uh, uh, I believe that, you know, like I said, I believe it will, uh, it will not only be a blessing to you, but it'll be a blessing to the nations of the earth. If you have your Bible, let's get in the Word uh, this morning. And uh, we're going to begin by uh, picking up in Matthew, the eighth chapter. It said, when he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. I love Jesus' response to this. He said, Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You know, uh, I, I think one of the things that could be said, and that's really not going to be the thrust of what I want to share here, but I think sometimes there's a question in the minds of, of God's people, uh, is it the will of God to heal? In my opinion, you know, everything Jesus paid for in his redemptive work is ours by inheritance. I believe it is always the will of God to heal. I don't think sin, sickness, poverty, or death, or any of those things are, 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 are uh, something that God would use uh, to, to process us. I can remember coming from a message where we used to talk about, you know, well, God's using that to perfect you, or God is using that to deal with something in your life. If that's the case, then uh, don't ever pray for somebody that's sick. But I think here's the key answer when Jesus is asked by this leper, you can make me clean if you want to. And Jesus said, I will be thou clean. I think that also is a great example 
of an effectual fervent prayer. I think sometimes we think we've got to pray until our blood vessels uh, burst or we, we get high blood pressure, uh, but Jesus simply speaks the word and the leper is cleansed. He really is in fulfillment of a lot of things that the prophetic prophets were declaring concerning him. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out devils. He literally is demonstrating what the kingdom looks like. He is demonstrating how the Father feels towards his creation and his heart uh, as he begins to reveal his, his whole purpose in ministry is to ease the suffering of the human condition. I really believe that salvation is more than just a deliverance from sin, and that's greatly a part of it. But I believe he came to deliver us from sin, sickness, poverty, and death. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement for my peace was laid on him by whose stripes we are healed. And so Jesus paid a price to be able to, uh, to give to us what is ours by inheritance, which part of it is healing. The heart of God, he just simply is showing his heart here, is to ease the suffering of the human condition. He came to cleanse the leper. That could be on so many levels, both spiritual and physical. He wants to deal the, with the leprosy of, uh, of, the, of the problems with our flesh. But God deals with this and, and gives this man a great miracle. I want to move on down because though, though the emphasis of what I want to share in this segment uh, is just below this and a few verses below that. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell it to no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Let me just make a few comments about that as well. Is that Jesus says, you know, I think it's pretty, it's kind of pretty cool. Mostly if somebody had healed somebody like this, they don't want to have been on CNN the next day or, uh, you know, or some television program again showing them. But Jesus says, don't, don't tell nobody. Probably he knew human nature and said, you know, if I tell them not to tell everybody, they're going to tell everybody they come across. Because I tell you, that would be a hard thing to keep hid would because you, you, you would see yourself and say, man, I had leprosy just a little while ago and look, I've been healed. And people, that to me uh, was, would be such a powerful testimony of the power of God. But what I want to say also in this is that Jesus in Matthew, uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we said in the segments whenever I, I was on uh, teaching with Dr. Weldon back some time ago about seeing God through the lens of covenant, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament, but they are still in the Old Covenant. Jesus is introducing the kingdom. He is introducing the life of of the coming age to come that's out before them that would be part of a new covenant paradigm. And so when he tells this man, see, I don't think Jesus, if he were walking the planet today and he healed a leopard or he, uh, you know, had healed someone, I don't think he would tell you to go show yourself to the priest and then offer a, a sacrificial gift that Moses required. Uh, the sacrifice has already been made. But this man was up under an old covenant, and Jesus had just demonstrated what the kingdom is going to look like, and he's kind of like given free samples to demonstrate the kingdom, you know, in the earth. And, uh, and as he does that, he tells him, you know, to follow through with what is the requirement of this particular covenant. But he's really transitioning them in their thinking. He's showing them a view of God that they have not had before. Uh, they've not, they, they, they picture God through this old covenant paradigm again, and they see him as this austere uh, old man sitting on a Victorian chair three miles south of Mars. I've been teaching quite a bit about seeing God through the lens of covenant because I, you know, there's a lot of people out there now that, you know, they're, they almost want to throw away the validity of the scripture because it doesn't fit with their doctrine. Uh, but I believe the scriptures God breathed. I believe it's given by inspiration of God. I don't believe you have to throw out the scripture to try to explain God. I think you simply have to understand him through the eyes of covenant. And I want to come back and just review a little bit of something, you know, that we talked about earlier uh, on the program back probably about four or five weeks ago. But what we don't understand is that there are probably at least, at least five major covenants. There was the covenant God made with Noah where he puts the bow in the cloud. There was the covenant that God made with Abraham. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant was the covenant, of course, that God made with Abraham. And it was a covenant that was, we told you in uh, uh, 
you know, past segments, what was called a grant covenant. It was God saying, it's a one-sided covenant. This is the kind of covenant you want. It's when God, who is the greater, blesses us and just says to them, Him, in blessing, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to give you a seed that like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the heavens, I'm going to, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I'm going to, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was the Abrahamic covenant. He tells Abraham, I'm going to give you a seed. They're going to come back in and possess this land. And then uh, you move on from the Abrahamic covenant to the Mosaic covenant, which was given in around Exodus 19. When God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them out based on the Abrahamic covenant, not the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant had not yet been given until around Exodus chapter number 19. He brought them out because of his promise to Abraham. Some of these people that he brought out of Egypt didn't even want to leave Egypt. Some of them probably had no real understanding concerning the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But God told Abraham, your seed's going to go into the land of Egypt because he says this, Israel is my firstborn. And he says to him, uh, I'm going to bring him and out of Egypt have I called my son. Same terminology that is used concerning Jesus, the Son of God. When Herod came to pursue the child, Jesus was carried into Egypt where uh, he hid uh, from Herod uh, for a period of time while there are uh, Hebrew babies being killed. Jesus is being hid in Egypt because to fulfill the scripture that says, out of Egypt have I called my son. He said, Israel was my firstborn. Israel is my son. Uh, the Israel of God... This is maybe a little bit controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. The Israel of God has never just been a nation. The Israel of God was his firstborn, his son. And, and if you care, it's, it, it is the people of God, not by natural descent, but the people of God who come in through the faith of Jesus Christ. Because, see, here's what the book of Galatians says concerning even the seed of Abraham. Because it says this in the book of Galatians. It said the law was added because of the transgression, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And the seed that was to come to whom the promise was made was not to seeds as of many, but to one seed and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Christ was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and he was the fulfillment of the promise that God had made to the fathers. And when this starts out even listing his lineage in the scriptures, it will say things like Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And because it's showing you his covenantal connection, he's showing you that he is the fulfillment of the seed of Abraham. He is the fulfillment of the royal seed of David that would forever sit on the throne of his glory and rule his kingdom forever. That kingdom was not, he's not talking about the uh, one out of the, the loins of David in the sense of being a natural seed like somebody yet to come. Jesus is that royal seed of David that had the mandate uh, to sit on the throne. He's now seated forever. According to the book of Ephesians, he sat down at the right hand of God. He's reigning right now. He's the royal seed of David and his kingdom is not a naturalistic kingdom any longer. It is a spiritual kingdom, and while it is spiritual, it affects everything that happens in the land. But the, the, the Davidic uh, covenant is not what I'm pushing right now. What I want you to see is that he said that the seed, that the, uh, that the law was added because of the transgression until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Uh, the transgression was not a transgression of the law of Moses, because the law of Moses has not been given in Exodus 19. The transgression was prior to that when the people failed. The only thing that was required of the Abrahamic covenant, and that was to believe God, just like Abraham did. And when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them out based on the Abrahamic covenant. Now let me go on and say this to you as well, because Galatians not only says 
that the law was added until, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And he saith not to seeds as of many, but to one seed and to thy seed, which is Christ. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed. And you are heirs according to the promise. Now you can give your inheritance away if you want to. But as believers who come into the covenant by faith, by the faith of Abraham, those who are of the faith of Abraham are the children of promise. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself, when he stood on this planet, looked at all of these unbelieving Jews, and we'll get down here even in this chapter and address some of this a little bit. He sees these unbelieving Jews, and he says to them, he said, you're not Abraham's seed. He's talking to natural Jews. He said, you are not Abraham's seed. If you were Abraham's seed, you would believe my words. And if you didn't believe me for the word, believe me for my work's sake. You ought to at least know that I'm the fulfillment of the prophecies that was given concerning them. He says, but you're not Abraham's seed. You are of your father, the devil. It determines, what, what determines if you're Abraham's seed is who's your father. In the case with Jesus, God was his father. In the case with us, God is our Father. The promises that God made that I'll bless them, that bless you and curse them, that curse you, again, was not given to seeds as of many, but given to that one seed, which is Christ, and all that are in Christ. I'm not saying that Jews cannot be saved. I'm simply saying they got to come into the covenant of promise the same way you and I do, and that's through the new birth. Because the Scripture tells us in Romans that he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, whose circumcision is in the heart. Somebody said, well, you're preaching replacement theology, to which I reply, I am not preaching replacement theology. I am preaching placement theology. The promise was always made, always made. The seed God made this promise to, clear back in Genesis, that make your name great, that in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. I'm going to give you a seed that's like the sand of the seashore and like the stars of the heaven. That seed that he was talking about was, uh, you know, uh, was not a, a, a physical, literal. It was it, thy seed, Galatians says, not seeds as of many, one seed. And that seed is Christ. And out of the loins of Christ in the new birth experience, there's a multitude in the earth that are like the sand of the seashore, and they're like the stars of the heavens. They're the seed of promise. They're the people upon whom God always made the promise. And even through uh, the period of time in which Jesus is offering this to the natural nation of Israel, the remnant that are brought in are the people of God who came into the covenants of promise through faith. There were believers that came in out of the nation of Israel because God's intention was to make out of twain one new man. So really, if replacement theology is not... Uh, talking about a spiritual is a replacement theology is when you try to make a natural seed replace the seed that God was always talking to, and that was Christ. That's replacement theology. You're replacing Jesus with a natural genealogy. And see, to, uh, you know, I, I think anybody that's a believer would have to understand that Jesus, even as he said, if he says, if you listen, except you be born again, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so you, you, it's through the born again experience. It's not through the natural physical circumcision. It's those who've been uh, had a circumcision of the heart. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, whose, whose circumcision is not in the flesh, but it's in the heart. So, you know, I, I believe that God has a nation of people. Of course it includes. Of course it includes natural Israel. But God opens a bigger circle and says, listen, there's only one way into the covenants of promise, and it's not through your natural descent. And that's what even, you know, I, I really didn't want to sidetrack here, but uh, let me jump over here in Galatians, the fourth chapter, because Galatians is a lot of the stuff that I'm quoting here. And I really didn't even intend to kind of come over here and get on this, but, but it's, it's, it's so clear to me, especially when you read it in the Amplified Bible, the latter part, it says, tell me, this is verse 21, Galatians the fourth chapter, tell me you who are bent on being under the law, do you not listen to what the law really says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, Hagar, and one by the free woman, which was Sarah. But the child of the slave woman was born according to the flesh and had an ordinary birth, the natural seed, if you will, while the son of the free woman was born in fulfillment of the promise, supernatural birth 
Now these facts are about to be used, uh, the, the apostle says, by me as an allegory. That is, I will illustrate by using them, for these women can represent two covenants. One covenant originated from Mount Sinai, where the law was given, that bears children destined for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is and represents Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. So he's telling them in Galatians 4 here, that who you thought was the seed of Abraham is actually the seed of Ishmael, because he's talking about this in terms of covenant. Seeing it through the lens of covenant. And he's saying that old covenant, Mount Sinai, is, it corresponds to Hagar. Abraham had two sons, Hagar and Sarah. And Hagar corresponds to Sinai. That's the old covenant in Arabia. And he tells you that these things are an allegory that illustrate these two covenants. And one of them originated from Mount Sinai where the law was given. And she bears children destined for slavery. She, she is Hagar. Now Hagar is and represents Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds with, uh, uh, for she is in slavery with her children, but the, uh, and corresponds with the present Jerusalem. So he, this is Paul in the first century telling you, listen, this natural present Jerusalem, that is an old covenant people, are, uh, are, are, are not the promised seed. They are Ishmael, and they are destined for slavery. And as long as you remain under law and under an old covenant paradigm, you are Hagar, Mount Sinai, that's where the law was given, in Arabia, and you are still in bondage as a slave. Because under the old covenant, we were slaves, but in the new covenant, we are sons. And if we're sons, then we're heirs. But he goes on to say, but the Jerusalem uh, above, that is the way of faith represented by Sarah is free and she is our mother for it is written in the scriptures. Re Rejoice, O barren woman who has not given birth and break forth into a joyful shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate woman has many more children than she who has a husband. And we, believing brothers and sisters like Isaac, are children not merely of physical descent like Ishmael was. We're not from the natural descent. But our, our children born of the promise, born miraculously. He's telling you that the real seed of Abraham that was promised clear back in Genesis was not the natural seed given by a natural birth, by natural genealogy that is still to this day in bondage with her children. And she is, uh, she is Hagar in Mount Sinai in Arabia. But we, brothers, who are believers, we believing brothers, are the children, uh, we, we like Isaac, are children not merely by physical uh, descent, like Ishmael, but are children born of the promise. We were born miraculously. But as at that time the child of the ordinary birth, born according to the flesh, persecuted the son who was born according to the promise and the working of the Spirit, so it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman, Hagar, and her son Ishmael, for never shall the son of the bondwoman be heir and share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. Now here's Paul talking to the Galatians in the first century, and he's saying, listen, folks, you got a lot of your sights set on natural Jerusalem and the natural seed. He said, but she would watch this, never be heir with the child of promise, because there's no other way into the covenant of promise other than through the supernatural birth, just like Isaac was in fulfillment not of what your flesh or your natural effort can produce, but in fulfillment of the promise. He goes on to say, so then believers, we who are born again, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for his purpose, are not children of a slave woman, the natural, but of the free woman, the supernatural. I don't, I don't know how much clearer you can get when you, when you read these kinds of verses. That is about as clear as I know how to make it. How uh, you can manipulate that to mean anything other than what is saying here, that the supernatural birth was the seed to whom the promise was made. And you and I as believers as a part of the messianic kingdom of Christ, as the new covenant, are not on Mount Sinai. We are in Mount Zion. What does Hebrews uh, the 12th chapter say? He said, for you did not come. 
to blackness and darkness. You did not come to a God who says stay away, but you've come to Mount Zion and you've come to the city of the living God. So when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them out based on the Abrahamic promise that he would bring these people back out of this, out of this Egypt into this promised land. Now, while they did return even into that physical promised land, when we get over to the book of Hebrews, uh, the Bible begins to shift again in Hebrews, and he tells you in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you would seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. They did not enter into his rest. And so he talks about this promised land in Hebrews 4, but this promised land is more than just a piece of real estate. It is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the land promise. For in Christ... All of God's promises are yes and amen. And if you are in Christ, then you are a land that flows with milk and honey. He talks about the promise again in uh, the book of Acts. He said, go to an upper room and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the promises are in Christ. All of the promises God made to Abraham and to David of the covenant or find their fulfillment in Christ, who is our, our promised seed. He is our promise of a king to reign. He is the promise of everything. And because we are in Christ, then we have access, not to just a piece of real estate, but we have in Christ, all of God's promises are yes and amen, so that we also have access to all of God's promises. And I believe as a people of a holy nation in the earth today that God purposes and intends for us to be what he wanted that first nation of Israel to be when he brought them out of Egypt. And that is he wanted them to be an entire nation of priests where everybody had personal relationship with God and where everybody could have access to the glory of God and could uh, minister to God and then minister God to the people. They were to be his priest in the earth. Peter grabs that in the book of Peter. He said, but you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. God restores us back to the priesthood. He's talking to the, 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 the seed of Abraham through Christ that we are blessed to be a blessing. Well, we're about to run out of time, but don't give your inheritance away. Know who you are. Uh, you're the seed of Abraham and you're blessing. Uh, we're just about to run out of time again. Uh, and man, it just goes by so fast. But if you'll take a moment to call that number on the screen or go to the email, go to our website. It's the easiest way to give. And there's a place where you can put your credit card in or your debit card and give if you'd like to do that. If you'd like to become a partner, you can set it up to give uh, with automatic debit. Uh, we do covet your prayers. We appreciate uh, you standing with us in what the Lord has called us to do. Be a part of that with us, and I believe the Lord will reward you greatly for it. Tune in again next week at the same time. God bless you for joining us this week. The word repentance means to change your mind. The message of John the Baptist and of Jesus was to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is accessed by a change in our thinking. If you are in outer darkness, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That reality is not always out in the distant future. It is in people's lives right now. One simple mind shift can move you out of darkness and weeping and into light and rejoicing. God wants to wipe all tears from our eyes and replace our weeping with joy.